It's been funny, Bill. The first thing everyone says to me when I tell them that I'm interviewing you is uh, some expression regarding safety. Right. Um, and I remember from our last chat, it seemed like you weren't overly concerned about it. Was I wrong? Well, I, I don't spend my time sort of twitching and looking over my shoulder and, and um, you know, getting all bent out of shape. But of course, I've got to be very concerned about my security. And in fact, recently, um, I've got another authoritarian regime after me. Um, I, I've just been um, named in a, ch in a major Hong Kong court case as a, quote, co-conspirator with Jimmy Lai, the newspaper publisher. Um, he's being charged under the, uh, under the new national security law in Hong Kong. I'm named as his co-conspirator along with one other foreigner. I've never met the guy, I should point out, yes. <laughs> or ever spoken to him or ever conspired with him in any way about anything. The only thing that I've ever done is lobbied for the Magnitsky Act. But, um, uh, <clears throat> and, we, and apparently, um, uh, we were just informed by our doorman downstairs that are a bunch of um, uh, mysterious-looking um, people of Chinese origin sniffing around the building. So it's not just, it's, it's not a, um, it's not a uh, uh, random thought, um, you know, th that bad guys could be lurking. You sort of say that with a smirk on your face. Um, how seriously do you take the idea that there are people looking for you so brazenly as to come to your office? Um, I, I take it very seriously. I don't, I don't, um, I don't mess around. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, I've been dealing with this kind of stuff for a long time. I'm not, I'm not an amateur. Okay. Um, and I know, uh, you know, I've got, uh, I've got things that I do and they've got things that they do. And, and um, you know, we'll see, see how it all plays itself out. I'm sure it's extremely bad form to try and press you on the details of that. What, what can you say without compromising yourself, the uh, behaviors you need to do to protect yourself from one, the Russian, um, uh, the Russian government or Vladimir Putin himself, who has a track record of assassinating people on British soil, um, and now the Chinese government. Well, on the Chinese issue, so now all of a sudden I've got a new... Um, uh, so Russia has been pretty much discredited in Interpol. So Interpol is one of the tools they tried to use to like get me back to Russia, arrest me with a red notice. And they're pretty much like, uh, on my case at least, you know, no longer able to use Interpol. But now, of course, the Chinese are jumping in uh, on the action. And then if they, were, if they were to honor the Chinese notice, I mean, it would really truly show that this, com this organization is an, uh, you know, just a totally incapable, um, incapable of, of fending off abusive notices. How do you explain that? Um, well, we, we, let's see what happens with Interpol. But um, um, a lot of these international organizations get abused by by uh, authoritarian regimes. As Putin's global reputation continues to sink, the costs of him acting out decrease. And uh, so I wonder, do you think that he gets more dangerous as his reputation sinks? I think that's good analysis for sure, <clears throat> that in the past, you know, taking me out on a London street would have led to massive sanctions. Um, but now there already are massive sanctions. So um, what, what does he have to lose? That's absolutely the case and, and very true and, and particularly worrying. On the other side, um, he's absolutely got his head filled with um, enemies um, far and wide, new enemies. Um, I mean, I used to really be at the top of his mind, but now there are probably 100 people on the top of his mind. And so he only has certain um, uh, resources. And the question is, how does he allocate those resources to like a historic enemy, Bill Browder, or to a current enemy, uh, you know, Vladimir Zelensky or Alexei Navalny. And so, um, uh, I, I mean, that doesn't make me feel better, but, it, but at the same time, I, I can, you know, sort of realistically see that, that he's got his hands pretty full right at the moment. At the moment. I uh, was interviewing someone earlier today, and uh, they were speculating as to why Navalny was still alive and had not been disappeared. And he suggests that it's got something to do with uh, Putin's reputation domestically. What do you make of that? Well, I think that, that if, if Putin were to kill Navalny, um, he doesn't know how many people would really get upset by that. Um, and, uh, and he's going into an election. I mean, and I, I, sh I shouldn't even use that word election because it's too, 
it, it's an insult to the word, uh, the concept of electing people. He doesn't elect, I mean, there's no election involved, but he, he's, he's in a, a, a transition moment when he doesn't need to have, <clears throat> you know, one million people protesting around Russia because he's killed their hero. And so uh, from his perspective right now, and I say, I, I, I stress right now, he's probably happy just having Navalny sitting in some isolated um, prison in the middle of nowhere where he can't really communicate with anybody other than a few random tweets and a few public statements. And he probably, feel, Putin probably feels like that's okay for the moment. But, you know, Navalny is, is extremely vulnerable. They tried to kill him once before. Didn't, they didn't succeed. And, and uh, you know, at some point, the, the calculus of killing him may be, the, the benefits of that will be um, greater than the cost. And, and it must be pretty scary to be Alexei Navalny right now. <laughs> My goodness. I mean, um, you can only imagine. Restrictions to your personal life, what do they look like in me taking these measures of security? Well, um, you know, starting at the, at the uh, sort of most macro level, I, I have to really be uh, super careful about which countries I travel to and which ones I don't. So um, and what does that mean? I, that means I've got to basically uh, eliminate 90, 98% of the countries in the world from... Um, I mean, I, I basically can't travel to any country that doesn't have a robust rule of law. Okay. And so any country that's, it doesn't, they don't have to be friendly with Russia. They can just be, you know, sort of corrupt. And if I get, show up at one of those countries and Russia has, is aware of that, they could issue a uh, uh, extradition notice for me. And then the, you know, president of that country will be approached by Putin and says, listen, here's, here's some oil or here's something because we want Bill Browder. And so, and, and that doesn't just apply to just traveling to countries, that applies to flying over countries. So if I wanted to visit Australia from London, um, if you look at the map, there's a lot of pretty dodgy places you've got to fly over. And, um, you know, it's, the information is available to everybody in dodgy places who's on board aircraft. That's part of the deal. And so if I want to go to Australia, I've got to fly from London uh, to Los Angeles yeah. and then Los Angeles to Sydney. I can't go, um, I can't go the, the way that everyone else goes. Right. In Red Notice, you explained this voucher system you participated in and the chaos of the Russian privatization of its economy, which was part of Perestroika. What have been the long-term effects of Perestroika on Russian culture and then the Russian economy? Well... Perestroika was just like the thaw between Russia and the West. Um, you know, what, what happened after that was what had the most devastating long-term consequences. And so when Russia went from communism to capitalism, when Boris Yeltsin became the president, when they did the mass privatization program, um, it was kind of like building a house um, with good architectural plans, but forgetting to put in the plumbing and electricity. And... Um, the plumbing and electricity in this particular house is rule of law, property rights, um, solid institutions. And so you can sort of define yourself as whatever you want, capitalist, whatever. Um, if you don't have all the infrastructure in place, the institutions and, and the courts and all this kind of stuff to make it work, then it all gets sort of chaotic very quickly. And that's what happened in Russia. It became uh, law of the jungle, survival of the fittest. And who, who were the fittest? The most brutal, the people who were ready to kill, the mafia, and then the oligarchs, um, and then the what I call the law enforcement mafia, where you have people who use the power to arrest um, in order to extort enormous amounts of money for themselves. But what are the downstream consequences on the culture? Well, the main downstream consequence about Russia and I'm not even sure this comes from recent events, I think it comes from Soviet times, is that anybody who had any sense of idealism, who wanted to do the right thing, ended up getting sent to the gulags and dying in the gulags. And so what's happened is if you go to Russia and 
you, you're idealistic in any way. I was idealistic. Um, every Russian will look at you and say, you're a fool. You're an idiot. What kind of idiot are you? Why are you doing that? What's in it for you? Where's the payoff? And so nobody does anything for any reason other than very narrow self-interest, usually financial interest. And so you, you, you have these most remarkable dysfunctions in Russia. You go to a, a, somebody's house for dinner, go to their apartment. Most people live in apartments in Moscow. They can be extremely wealthy. You go, go to their apartment and they have like the most beautiful paintings and marble floors and antique furniture. And the moment you step out into the hallway of their apartment building, it smells like urine. Why is that? Because like nobody is, you know, they're, they're ready to maximize on their own personal space, but nobody can even cooperate on like washing down the hallways and keeping them from people pissing in, their, in, the, in the vestibules of the hallways. I mean, it's just crazy. And that's what the entire culture of Russia is like. It, it got ruined by that. And, um, <clears throat> and so you have no philanthropy, no idealism, no... no um, you know, working in the national interest, no public service. Everybody is there for their own narrow financial interests. That's such a great example of, I'm thinking about James Robinson and Why Nations Fail, uh, how institutions <clears throat> are sort of the bedrock in their estimation of well-functioning societies that take care of, say, the public good. Um, and you could even argue your hallway is and even the public good. That's still a very private good. But what a cultural rot to have that seep into the into the core of what is it sounds like you're saying like the Russian identity. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, you, you almost can't blame the Russians for it because they, they they've been conditioned over generations <clears throat> that if you if you make any any uh, if you do anything that that's like the right thing to do, you'll be punished for it. I can remember one time in Moscow when I lived there, um, <clears throat> I was driving. Uh, it was like a late winter night, very slushy, snowy road, dark. Um, I was going to play tennis, and I'm with my uh, Russian driver, who was a former policeman, and um, I see that this guy is is sort of up ahead of us. It looks first, it looked like there's some kind of like some, something had fallen off the back of a truck. It was like a sack or something like that. And then as we approached, I could see, and we, we came to a red light, and I could see it was a, an, a person who was laying in the middle of the road twitching. And there was like three lanes on each side. And he was like laying there. We were stopped. And I started to get out of the car. And my driver like uh, uh, tried, tried to stop me from getting out of the car. And, and I said, no, we got to help this guy. And um, he couldn't convince me to stop. And so he eventually grudgingly comes out. And we, the, together we, we, try, we take this guy who's twitching. And we drag him um, across. He was in the middle of the road. We drag him across to the side of the road where there's a soft snowbank where we where he could and we we we, we lay him down and, and, and as we are laying him down he comes to and he, he was having an epileptic seizure and um it was just at this point that the police arrived and the police immediately blamed my driver for hitting him and it was only because he was a former police officer that he was able to extricate himself from the situation if he hadn't been even though the guy hadn't even been hit he had an epileptic seizure in the middle of the road um doing the right thing would have could have cost him his whole life. Wow, well, because they saw an opportunity for bribery. And, and bribery or, or whatever, uh, ruining someone's life for, for whatever benefit they, they could get out of that. Yeah. I remember listening to that anecdote. Was it Freezing Water or Red Notice? It was in my book, Red Notice. Yeah. Um, it's quite a desolate picture of Russia you're painting here. It's a desolate place. And, and um, uh, you know, and any, any Russian who's worth their salt is trying to get out, has gotten out. I mean, there's some... Yeah. Huge, huge amount of, of exodus of reasonable people because why would you want to raise children? Why would you want to have a life? Why would you want to invest your human capital in a place like that? Are there any people you keep track of or um, have a large profile in Russian media that are still, you know, hanging on and trying to do the right thing that you know of? No, every, every reasonable person I know is, um, every reasonable Russian I know is either dead in jail or in exile. There's no, there's no, you, you can no longer be a reasonable person and operate openly in Russia. You're, you're either part of their criminal system or you're, you're, you're ruined. Christ. I mean, so what do you do from here then? Well, it's, it's now a, a, the, the whole purpose is containment, um, you know, and, 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 and they need to be contained because look what they're doing in Ukraine. So my, 
you know, I'm, I'm trying to help my friends who are in jail in Russia mm-hmm. any way I can, and I'm trying to help the Ukrainians any way I can to push the Russians back. They need to be taught a lesson. They, they can't be uh, rewarded for doing what they've done in Ukraine. The, the misery and the death and destruction that they've inflicted on the Ukrainians is uh, immeasurable. Yeah, I was floored. I think it was two weeks ago was the single largest day of um, death during this conflict, a full two years after it first happened. You know, and the, and the Russians don't care about how many soldiers they kill. I should say Putin doesn't care about how many soldiers he kills. And so he, he's running out of ammunition the same way the Ukrainians are. Um, but the Russians just send almost effectively unarmed men forward. The Ukrainians have to shoot at them. The moment the Ukrainians shoot, the Russians know where to send their artillery, and then Ukrainians die. And so a lot of people are dying. And it's not very, it's, it's heartbreaking. I mean, the, the amount of death that's going on, and, and nobody has any way to stop it at the moment. Yeah, it's so sad. I've had on a guy, Alexander Kucherenko, twice onto the pod. Same age as me, same situation, same job in a software company. And just overnight, how just by the you know random uh, roll of the dice, he happens to be in Ukraine and asked to fight. And me and all these other equivalents across the world can continue to live our lives. Um, and there's not much of a point there just to say that it bringing brought so close to home, I think, has generated quite a, for me at least shitloads of empathy. Well, just think about it. So if, if your country was invaded by a foreign power and when those people occupy your country, they um, will rape your mother, your grandmother, uh, your daughters, your sister, um, if you, uh, they'll take you in, torture you, castrate you, and, um, and then kidnap your children. Are you going to fight? Yeah, you're damn well going to fight. And that's what, that's what it's all about. The Ukrainians have to fight. They have, they're, there's, they're, they're, the downside of fighting um, is smaller than the downside of what happens if the Russians win. Two years on from all the economic sanctions, almost two years on, from the Russian invasion of Ukraine, what is the state of the Russian economy, as far as you can tell? Um, well, not good. Not, not good. Now, Putin would like to, everybody to think that, oh, the sanctions haven't worked, so you might as well lift them. That's, that's his pitch. Um, but look at the situation. He's got $350 billion of, of his money that's been frozen. He has um, all the oligarchs' money is tied up and frozen. Um, uh, the banks can't borrow any money. The, the, the Russian government is banned from the international capital market, so they can't, they, they, they can't get access. They have no access to their savings. They have no access to borrowing money. Um, a thousand Western companies have pulled out uh, planes. There was a great little story a couple of days ago that, uh, you know, the planes are, are, are like, you know, running out of parts and they, they get stuck in different places. They're, they're having emergency landings. Um, they're, they're now having to, they're asking people in certain regions to like um, find Japanese or European bolts um, from, from like equipment because um, the stuff that they, they can buy made in Russia or made in China is just not good enough and they need it for the military purposes. Um, you've got, uh, I don't know if you've seen these images, but there's like, um, you know, we, we all thought we were going to get frozen in the West when they stopped supplying gas. And all of a sudden, because they don't have equipment, they're freezing in all sorts of different parts of Russia. Oh, really? No, I haven't they're, seen They're freezing, literally freezing. They, they like, um, boiler systems are going out in different places and they're literally freezing. I mean, it's, it's, it's so just grim. It's ho- so horrible. What, what they're, what's happening. They claim that there's no economic damage. Well, I, I wouldn't trust a sting, single number that comes out of Russia because they just make the stuff up. I think they're suffering, they're suffering very profoundly. What about uh, London in all of this and the, say, wealth of the oligarchs, which is very well documented, flows through this city? In your estimation, how has London changed in, from that perspective? Well, um, uh, they're no longer coming here anymore. Um, the biggest ones are leaving. Um, Michael Friedman left. Um, Peter Avin left. Um, German Kahn left. Abramovich left. Um, th- if you go to the estate agents, there's no, no Russians buying property here okay. anymore. Fantastic signals. Yeah. Um, uh, banks will not open accounts for you. I mean, there's a lot of Russians who are not oligarchs who, are, who can't get bank accounts here. Um, 
having said that, this is a safe country. And so if they can be here, stay here, they'd rather be here than be in Russia and sent to the front line. But isn't uh, the main reason they were here in the first place is because of the offshore plumbing and financial opacity runs so deep that they don't need to necessarily you know, open up banks or go through real estate agents. Well, um, that's true, but but everybody now is under the microscope here. I mean, it, yes, there's a lot of historic business, historic companies set up here, historic banking relationships. Nobody's going to set up any new banking relationships. Anyone who gets caught doing that will actually get in trouble now, which is not wasn't the case before. You know, there's a real political uh, there's a political agenda to like enforce laws that were not enforced in the past. And so I would say on the margin going forward, Britain is doing the right thing. They've got a, a nasty 20-year history cleanup, and that's going to take a lot longer than a year or two. So the bull case is that they have certainly moved in the right direction. What's the bearish outlook for Russian money running through the city? Well, the biggest bearish outlook is that um, uh, you know the war goes on for a while. People get tired of the war. Putin has more staying power um, than the Ukrainians because the Ukrainians are reliant on us and we don't have staying power. And and the, the really catastrophic situation is that that it looks like Putin will win. And then, and then um, you know, in some horrible uh, peace deal, um, we lift the sanctions and effectively reward him for for uh, for what he did. And I can I can imagine, I, you know, that that's not an unlikely scenario. The Global Magnitsky Act. I heard you reference in an interview you did about how there are a number of new countries and individuals that are in your crosshairs, but you didn't expand on to who those individuals were. Well, um, basically, the, the Global Magnitsky Act um, targets human rights abusers and kleptocrats in lots of different countries. And, and uh, there's a lot of uh, human rights abusers and kleptocrats in a lot of different countries. And, and what's so, so wonderful about the Magnitsky Act is that um, it's kind of taken on a life of its own. There's now whole organizations who are in the business of getting people sanctioned under the Global Magnitsky Act. There's uh, you know, full NGOs that put in evidence and sanctioned packages. And so you have all sorts of people who have been victimized that never had any recourse before who all of a sudden have recourse. And so from my perspective, the best part of the Global Magnitsky Act is just the proliferation of trouble for all sorts of people all over the world coming from all different corners. People, you know, all these bad guys thought that they were, they could just get away with stuff. And all of a sudden they're finding them, you know, some, some little group from, from nowhere puts together a, a well-argued, well-evidenced yeah. sanctions, sanctions package and presents it to the state department and the foreign office here in various places. And all of a sudden, you know, somebody who thought they were totally untouchable finds all their money frozen. It's great. It's really, it, it really is sort of like, you know, evening up the, the leveling the playing field and evening the score. Have you tried, to, speaking of uh, a scoreboard, have you tried to measure uh, the precise dollar amount that your efforts and your team's efforts have resulted in frozen cash? I've not tried to estimate it. And, and the number is not going to be that huge. Um, but, but what happens is, is that someone gets put on the Magnitsky list. And maybe they'll have some cash in the UK or in the US and that gets frozen. But the main detriment of being put on the Magnitsky list is that no bank in the world will ever do business with you anymore. And so it may be that, that your money doesn't even get frozen, but you can't touch it anymore because the bank doesn't want to move it. And so you have your money in Switzerland. They're not part of the Magnitsky uh, uh, system. But the Swiss banks don't want to get into trouble by moving money anywhere else. And so you, you, know, you effectively become paralyzed. Right. And so... And that, that there, the numbers are huge, absolutely huge, of, of total financial paralysis of bad people doing bad things. For example? Uh, you know, I, 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 I won't name the name, but there was a big Russian oligarch who was sanctioned. He had a, a lot of money in, in Switzerland um, uh, at a big Swiss bank. He wanted to move it to um, a big Russian bank. And the Swiss bank thought if they, if they move the money... The, they could be they could be fined by the U.S. Treasury three times the amount um, uh, that 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 they wanted to move, and so they don't they won't move the money, and then all of a sudden the oligarch is saying, "But I need that money," and, and, and you have no legal basis to not move it, and so and so what happens to them? They um uh, uh, they, they, I mean on one hand they don't want to be sued by the oligarch, on the other hand they don't want to be sued by the U.S. government, 
And so what do they do the next day? Um, they fire all their Russian clients <laughs> because they don't want to ever, ever be in that, in that position. This is a right. true story. Okay. They don't ever want to be in that position Which again. Which bank? Uh, I don't want to say the okay, bank. Okay. Well, I will. So, it's Credit Suisse uh, uh, because they don't even exist anymore. No, so. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and, so they don't, and so that's a great example of how, how this whole thing works, that, that all of a sudden um, these people become international financial pariahs. Mm. But then again, you are backed up against the wall of financial opacity and offshore finance. Well, that's true, except for the banks are now really under the microscope, and, and, and they're all scared to death. They really are scared to death of, of being on the wrong side of all these things. I mean, I'll tell you another great story. <laughs> Keep them coming, Bill. <laughs> uh, uh, some oligarch decides he has a $65 million yacht. I can't remember why, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but let's say he took out a $25 million loan um, to buy the yacht, the rest of the money was his his principal. He's paying the loan all fine, and this is again, I think, Credit Suisse story. And and uh, um, at some point in the middle of the loan, um, uh, the guy gets put on the uh, sanctions list. So he gets put on the sanctions list, and um, he can't pay pay back the loan anymore because if he does that, um, Credit, Credit Suisse won't take the money because he's in violation of sanctions. So the, they say, well, sorry, you, you're not paying back. You can't pay back the money because you're in violation of sanctions. But because you're not paying back the money, you're in default of the loan. So they go out and auction the yacht for like $40 million. Um, it's a, the guy paid $65 million for it. <laughs> he loses his yacht. They get their money back. End of story. Are you familiar with the term a rogues gallery? Yep. Who is on country profiles, not individuals, on your rogues gallery, say top five for the Global Magnitsky Act? Well, it's obvious. It's Russia, of course, China, of course, um, Iran, of course, um, Saudi Arabia. And then there's all sorts of people competing. The for, UAE? Uh, UAE. Uh, I mean, UAE is, is um, not in the same league. I mean, they've done some bad stuff, um, but they've also done some good stuff. They've helped free a bunch of you know, hostages and things like that. Um, but they've also imprisoned various people, including somebody who I'm trying to get out of jail named Ryan Cornelius. Um, uh, I don't know, but like Nicaragua. Nicaragua, um, the um, dictator of Nicaragua, Ortega, arrested everybody from the far left to the far right. <laughs> everybody. Um, and, and, and had two, 200 opposition people in jail. Um, I mean, he, cre- he created like the most unified opposition after arresting everybody. And, and two years later, he let them all out of jail and, and, and deported them to America. Um, you know, there's probably a lot more Magnitsky sanctions needing done there. And rogues gallery for individuals, top five. Well, I mean, that's, um, uh, I mean, it sort of falls into the same, <laughs> the same list. You have Putin. Actually, we forgot about uh, Lukashenko in, the, in our previous rogues gallery. Uh, Putin, Lukashenko, Xi, um, MBS, um, you know, and then, uh, of course, North Korea. But, um, I mean, there's, there's so many of them. I mean, it's, it's hard to pick and choose because there's so many bad guys out there. You're swimming in rather like depressing waters much at the time. How do you sort of maintain a sunny optimism or at least, uh, actually, you know, that's a terrible question. That's to, right. That's up to you. you, you no, no, it's up, what do you think? Is that a question worth answering or? I mean, sure. I mean, I, I, I the answer is that, that actually I'm, I, I, uh, I probably have a sunnier disposition with all the stuff I'm doing now than I ever did, you know, in the world of finance. Right. Um, uh, you know, when you're trying to, do good and trying to stop bad and and you get to see a lot of bad but you also get to see a lot of good i mean there's a lot of heroes out there do you know sacrificing everything um you know you don't get to see that in regular day-to-day life i get to see that a lot then let's invert the rogues gallery who are the say top three individuals you want to give a shout out to um well the most important one i want to give a shout out to is my good friend and ally vladimir karamurza vladimir is um, helped me with the Magnitsky Act. Um, he, he, he spoke on behalf of the Russian opposition in front of parliaments all over the world, got the, which got the Magnitsky Act passed in 35 different countries. Um, Vladimir is, was um, a huge thorn in the side of Vladimir Putin. Um, they tried to kill him twice with poison. He survived. He went back to Russia after the start of the war um, to protest the war. <clears throat> I begged him not to go. He said, how can I not go? Um, how can I ask my own people to stand up to Putin if I'm not willing to go there myself? And he went on CNN, called Putin a war criminal and a murderer, 
and was immediately arrested and sentenced to treason, high treason, and he's serving a 25-year sentence in Omsk, Siberia, in solitary confinement. I mean, this is a Nelson Mandela type of character, um, and, and I, I fear for him, and I pray for him, and I'm doing everything I can for him, and, and people should know, know his name. You know, people know the name Alexei Navalny, um, who has been much more public. He has an uh, Oscar-winning documentary in back of him. Vladimir Karamurz is a name that many people uh, in the know know, but a lot of people in regular life don't know. He's a true and absolute hero and somebody who, who deserves everything. Um, Jimmy Lai. Jimmy Lai is the publisher of the Apple Daily News in Hong Kong. Um, when China um, issued their national security law and took over Hong Kong and oppressed the people, he stood up. He was a very rich man. He ran a newspaper. He could have left and lived a good life in the West. Instead, he uh, uh, stayed and protested, and now he's um, on trial in Hong Kong as the first major target of the national security law. Um, he's a guy, uh, another man who's made you know, sort of infinite sacrifice uh, for doing the right thing. Um, and, um, and then there's just so many other heroes. Uh, um, uh, uh, we had... We had um, we have something called the Magnitsky Prize that we award to various people who have done heroic things. And every year we give seven of them out. And we've been doing it now for nine years. And so I've got more than 60 <laughs> who compete nice, for the next place. Nice. Who won it this year? Last um, year, sorry. Uh, last year um, we had a, um, uh, an unbelievable man from Ukraine named Kuleba who runs an organization that frees kidnapped Russian children um, uh, okay, I'm sorry, kidna kidnapped Ukrainian children from Russia. Um, we had the um, uh, we had the daughters of Paul Rosessa Bajina, um, two daughters who he saved. Paul Rosessa Bajina was the hero of Hotel Rwanda. Um, he saved these two girls when they were orphans during the Hotel Rwanda incident that many people watched in the movie. Um, he was a critic of Paul Kagame, the dictator of of, uh, of Rwanda. Um, he was kidnapped. And, and sentenced to 25 years in jail in Rwanda. And these two young women gave up their um, comfort of their lives and quit their jobs and went on an international worldwide mission to free their father who had sa and to save his life. And after two years, um, they got him out of jail. And it was really, and we had them at the awards um, with their father. Um, and it was really the most moving moment to, to um, see them all there, him free and, and, these two, at the time, babies who he'd saved, who had then gone on to save his life. Gee, I can only imagine. The whole room was uh, flooding. Well, it wasn't a dry eye in the house. Yeah. And we were saying before we started recording um, how you uh, have the, the, an ambition for the Magnitsky Prize to you know, one day be known, not only to everyone walking the street like, say, the Nobel Prize is, but as well anticipated. Who's it going to be this year? Who are the people nominated? Oh, wow, look what they've done. How could we ever choose? Yeah, it's, it's, um, uh, we, 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 we set up the Magnitsky Prize, um, and we, we awarded on the day that Sergei Magnitsky was murdered. And this is a way of remembering Sergei and a way of, of honoring people who have made the same type of heroic sacrifices that Sergei made. And, and it really is, I mean, it's tr anybody who's ever been to one of these ceremonies says it's the most moving night of their year um, to be in the presence of these heroes. And what's interesting about it is, is it's, it's like the heroism is not defined by region or by, by profession or by nationality or by anything. You know, there's just, you, you find these great heroes from all over the world doing unbelievable things and the sacrifices that they make and the, and the, and the change that they, uh, that they affect. And, and it gives everybody who sits in that room a sense that they're, of optimism because in a terrible world, there, there are, you know, there, there's heroism in all sorts of places you wouldn't expect it and when is the award <laughs> uh, night it's so it's sergey magnitsky was killed on november 16 2009 so every year on november 16th we have the award ceremony we've only got a few more minutes bill um so let's see how quick we can touch on them how has your life changed as your public profile has increased um, well, it's I become a target of all sorts of people in all sorts of ways. The the uh, the more high profile I am, the more lawsuits, the more arrest warrants, the more 
um, online harassment, the more smear campaigns. Um, uh, but, but the other thing which has happened is that I've been doing this for a really long time, and um, and I, I'm I'm much more reflexive when bad, bad stuff comes my way. I don't have an emotional reaction anymore. I kind of know what to do. Um, I um, I'm pretty good at fending off attacks, which doesn't mean that I'll. I'll I mean, you know, who knows what can happen next? But but um, uh, you know, as my profile is raised. It comes at me, but as the time goes on, I get better at, at dealing with it. When you're consuming media around the Russia-Ukraine war, how are you at filtering as close to the truth as possible, given, I don't need to tell you, but it's fraught. Yeah, well, everything is fraught. All, all news is fraught. You now. could say this particularly so, though. Yeah. Well, it's, it is and it isn't. I mean, it, I... I um, uh, because I know pr- pretty much everybody who's reporting. I know who the credible people are. I know who the people are who are not credible. I know who the agents of influence are for the Russians. I know who the, um, uh, you know, I know people who, who everybody's agenda. So it's it's kind of, I mean, I'm just generally looking for facts. I'm looking for verifiable facts. I'm not looking for opinion. And, and I'm able to digest facts in a way that, you know, and draw... You know, we'll, we'll, you know, figure out where the webs of, of you know, misinformation are and, and so on. And um, uh, for, so for me, I can kind of, like, just to give you an example, the, um, the New York Times two weeks ago reported that there is an active effort underway by Russia to negotiate a ceasefire in Ukraine. And I, I saw that article, and I knew exactly what was going on. <laughs> there, there's, there are a bunch of, not that many, but there's a few... Um, Russian apologists in in the U.S. who who either wishfully thinking or manipulating thinking decided to uh, off the record share with a journalist that there was some kind of back channel effort going on for Russia to do a ceasefire. It was just at the moment um, that Congress was debating the fifty billion dollar aid package for Ukraine, and by the way, the same thing was going on in Europe. And so if you're, uh, if you're somebody on the, on the other side of that debate and you see that, that headline, you say, you know, why don't we just wait and see how that, this uh, ceasefire negotiation works out? And then you end up delaying for a month with, with, when the Russians had no intention whatsoever. And by the way, a week later, they sent in more missiles into Ukraine than they ever have in the history of this war. That's, a, that's an incredible example. Can you, are you comfortable giving a name, one to look out for, one to uh, follow? Um, in terms of who the agents of influence are? Or, or more, more so pit, either particular journalists or particular outlets? No, I, I, don't, I don't think I, I want to like, um, validate anyone who then becomes unvalidated later or right. vice versa. Right. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, and by the way, I'm not, I mean, many people in the Russian sphere you know, all share the same view. I mean, it's not like I'm some kind of true expert on this. Anybody who's been around long enough knows who, you know, can kind of read these articles and see them for what they are. And you can even see the reaction on Twitter when an article like that comes out. What is the function today of Hermitage Capital? Um, we're basically a campaign organization, human rights organization. I mean, it's not a, we don't manage anyone's capital. You don't capital. manage any capital? No. Do you, though, still think like an investor? Are you always surveying for value? Well, I, I mean, I, I am, uh, you know, first my first education was in business and as an investor. And so, uh, and I do invest my own money. And so I'm, you know, still thinking that way, but I don't spend a lot of my time on investing. I spend my time on, on human rights. How do you um, manage your own money? Um, I only invest in rule of law countries. <laughs> <laughs> countries you can fly to. Well, not just countries I can fly to, but countries where, where, where there are institutions and a rule of law, because, you know, everyone got all excited about China years ago. Um, and I was always saying, well, why would you invest there? It's uninvestable. If, they, if someone rips you off, and, and by the way, the incentives to rip you off become greater and greater the more successful your investment are, um, what are you going to do? Who are you going to go to if someone rips you off? Are you going to go to the Chinese courts and expect, uh, are you going to go to the Chinese government and expect some fair hearing? Is there a, a media you can go to? No. So how do you, how do you protect yourself? And nobody ever th- even thought about that when they were all looking at these growth rates in China. And of course, you know, Everything is down dramatically in China and, and even worse in the private markets. And so, you know, I never invested in China, but I won't invest in any non-rule of law country um, just because I want to know that my money is protected 
by the law. If someone rips me off, I can go to court. But it's in the stock market or no, it's no, diversified no, across a lot of different it's things. It's in different things, but um, it's in, in only in the United States and Western Europe because those are the places where I can uh, you know, get, get protection. Good marks to be in. I heard an interview in 2020 that your son had started a really successful company using AI to replace lawyers. I would love to hear how his journey has accelerated since then. Well, so the way the, way, the, the story starts when, when he was 18. He's 27 now, so this is nine years ago. I gave him a car um, for his 18th birthday. Not a nice car. It was, an old, it was like the beat-up um, 10-year-old car that, that we were phasing out of. I gave him the car, and he was the happiest guy in the world. And he loved his freedom, and he started driving everywhere. Like he and his friends would drive from London to Birmingham to Burger King just to drive to somewhere. And um, and in the process, he started getting parking tickets. <laughs> and parking tickets in London are pretty expensive. And um, I paid the first ticket and and grumbled. I paid the second ticket, grumbled even more. And by the third ticket, I said, "This is the last one. You're on your own after this." And um, and he kept on getting tickets. And so so and he's a, he was a, he's a very smart young man and he um, didn't want to pay his tickets and so he started doing research into how parking law works and what what and he got a, did a freedom of information act request and all sorts of other stuff to figure out how parking fines are settled and he discovered that there's all sorts of um, ways in which you can appeal your parking ticket and he started writing to the, the local council and getting out of his tickets and and I guess basically I, I didn't even know if they read the letters they just figured if someone is going to write a letter um, they don't have the resources to review it, and so they just excuse you. And so anyways, he started writing these letters, getting out of his parking tickets, and um, and then he started bragging to his friends. And they said, oh, can you write me a letter? And so he eventually created a website um, called Do Not Pay, which helped people get out of parking tickets. And some mother in the school wrote, uh, was a journalist for the Huffington Post. She wrote a story about him, and then all of a sudden he was in the BBC and Sky News and Telegraph and Times, and he went, his website from, went from 100 users to 100,000 users. Amazing. And then eventually, um, uh, he went off to Stanford University. Um, and he was spotted by the venture capital community that thought he had a good idea. And, um, and it started small. And it, now he's got like, I don't know, 200 different uh, uses, not just parking tickets, but canceling subscriptions, fighting with your bank, doing all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, the company is is on a is, you know tearing it up. He's got the be- very best venture capital firms in 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 the United States backing him. Um, he's profitable, which is like very unusual in, in technology, growing growing at leaps and bounds. And 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 of course he's a hero for the underdog because um, you know all these um, you know government agencies or big corporations are always trying to rip rip off the little guy. And he's now. Um, Got this web, got this app, this website that where you know the little guy. I think it costs three dollars a month, and you can fight back. And particularly in the last year or two, how is he? When he messages you, when you talk to him, and he says that, have you seen what's happening in AI? This is what we're doing with it now. He must be really right at the cutting edge of actual implementation from a business perspective. Well, he's right at the cutting edge, and in, and in fact, <clears throat> all these lawyers are terrified of him. So, I mean, his whole thing is, is like to, you know, empower the little guy and lawyers hate him. And so he's been sued um, in class action suits. He's like knocking them out one after the other. But these class action suits by lawyers trying to shut him down. It's like coal miners trying to stop, you know, electricity generation from, you know, solar power. Um, uh, It's really kind of gratifying. Um, And and it's also gratifying to watch, uh, watch, his name is Joshua Browder, by the way. We didn't mention his name. Do not pay as his company. Um, uh, but to watch how he is really turned into this, you know, guru um, in in you know ha- how technology and and putting aside all the hype and all the nonsense, um, he's actually able to see sort of like wh- wh- how it how it can be used and where it can be used. And anybody who sends, spends any time with him, um, uh, you know, walks away just you know f- fully amazed. We we have this joke in our family. Um, we, we, you know, he spends a lot of time with me and, and oftentimes people will come over for dinner or whatever. And the, the joke is uh, they come for Bill Browder and stay for Joshua Browder. <laughs> nice. And there was a quite a nice moment last time we spoke. Um, you revealed that your dad was listening to Red Notice on audiobook again and again um, while he was very sick in hospital. And, you know, although you'd been the sort of renegade capitalist and maybe somehow disappointing from that measure to the family, it was like, 
dad's really proud of me look what i've done um it's amazing you get to see this for your own boy 27 who's already uh, super successful by so many metrics yeah well i mean there, you know as a father there's nothing you can hope more than than you know your first of all your children are healthy happy but but if they can be successful i mean that's really um uh, you know it's true icing on the cake and 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 not so much that he's successful but he's happy because he's successful and you know that that's that's what really you know touches me amazing knock this one out in a minute bill what is a country you're most bullish on what is a country i'm most bullish on wow that's a really tough one <laughs> this this is the um you know all the all the country every country i know is sort of competing you know it's like uh uh, they're competing to be worse than, than the next one. I mean, I, I, you know, I wish that there was like a, a great place where I could say is everybody is is like, you know, the governance is good and the economy is good. Mm-hmm. It's just like, who's worse than the next guy? You know, people are saying, oh, my God, look at the deficit in America. Well, you know, look at how much, uh, you know, debt, uh, you know, and all this kind of stuff and all this political dysfunction. Then look at Europe is even worse than that. And then, of course, you have the, you know, authoritarian regimes. Which it's And so... Uh, <sighs> I'm just looking around the world trying to figure out, like, how, how does, how, you know, every place is so bad. How, how, do, how do you avoid, like, how, where, how, how are we going to avoid a catastrophe? Disposition? <laughs> well, I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm still happy and healthy and have my family and my friends, so I can be happy. I can have a sunny disposition. But the world is 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 in a mess. I mean, and I don't think there's any way you can put a, you, know, you can sugarcoat it. And, and, and putting aside even governance of different countries, I mean, you, you have... You know, this statistic that just came out that t- 2023 was the hottest year, yeah. you know, I mean, God, God only knows what, what's going to happen, you know, with, you know, with all the um, effects of climate change and global warming and, and, you know, nobody wants to go on vacation to the south of France. And now they go to the north of France. It's too hot in the south of France. And, you know, polar ice caps melting and, and um, forest fires everywhere. I mean, it's, uh, you know, scary. And... In and amongst these ashes of um, a lot of dour outlooks for many countries, is there not one which sort of you think is worth highlighting for having potentially a very bullish future? You know, I, off the top of my head, I, I, I really can't even say yes. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Nor is it all, Bill. Uh, thank you so much again for being so generous with your time. Thank you.